Hello, hello, how we doing, Austin? How we doing, Austin? All right, so they mentioned a few accolades. I'm the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League. From time to time, I model. Okay. But one of my favorite hats to wear is actually being an artist and a poet of code. And so oftentimes when I say I'm a poet of code, people are like, okay, what does that even mean? So I like to show it, and I want to show it with a poem called AI Ain't I a Woman, which is both a spoken word poem and an algorithmic audit. It was inspired by Sojourner Truth's 19th century poem, Ain't I a Woman, spoken in Akron, Ohio, to talk about the need to make women's rights more inclusive. And as we are in the month of March, we do want to emphasize, any women in the house? Okay. Any supporters of women in the house? It should be everybody. Okay, all good. So let's roll to AI, Ain't I a Woman. My heart smiles as I bask in their legacies, knowing their lives have altered many destinies. In her eyes, I see my mother's poise. In her face, I glimpse my auntie's grace. In this case of deja vu, a 19th century question comes into view. In a time when Sojourner Truth asked, ain't I a woman? Today we pose this question to new powers, making bets on artificial intelligence, hope towers. The Amazonians peek through windows blocking deep blues as faces increment scars. Old burns, new urns, collecting data chronicling our past, often forgetting to deal with gender, race, and class. Again I ask, ain't I a woman? Face by face the answers seem uncertain, young and old, proud icons are dismissed. Can machines ever see my queens as I view them? Can machines ever see our grandmothers as we knew them? Ida B. Wells, data science pioneer, hanging back, stacking stats on the lynching of humanity, teaching truths hidden in data, each entry and omission, a person worthy of respect. Shirley Chisholm, unbought and unbossed, the first black congresswoman, but not the first to be misunderstood by machines well-versed in data-driven mistakes. Michelle Obama, unabashed and unafraid to wear her crown of history, yet her crown seems a mystery to systems unsure of her hair. A wig, a buffon, a toupee, maybe not. Are there no words for our braids and our locks? Does relaxed hair and sunny skin make Oprah the first lady? Even for her face well known, some algorithms fault her. Echoing sentiments that strong women are men. We laugh, celebrating the successes of our sisters with Serena smiles. No label is worthy of our beauty. Machines are so neutral after all, you know? So this is a reflection of something I call the coded gaze. Who has heard of the male gaze? The white gaze? The post-colonial gaze? Okay, anyways, this adds to that lexicon. And so the coded gaze is really a reflection about power. Who has the power to shape the technologies with both their 
preferences, their priorities, and at times their prejudices. So I had the encounter with the coded gaze as a grad student at MIT. I was working on an art project, didn't go too well. It, my friends had fun with my projects, but I was putting on a white mask. And so I decided to share this story with a wide audience and I thought, you know what? People might check my claims, let me check myself. So I took my TED profile image and I ran it through various AI demos and I found that some didn't detect my face at all and the ones that did detect my face labeled me male. So I asked some questions, phenomenal female, so questions. I got even more concerned once I realized these types of technologies were entering the real world and really messing with people's lives. So you've had issues of false arrests, which I will get into, but not just issues of false arrest with AI-powered tools, anybody who has a photo posted on social media is likely in a database collected by Clearview AI, which has scraped over 30 billion photos online. And now with generative AI systems, it's not just the risk of being misidentified or matched with somebody else. Your own face, your likeness can be used in a deep fake. So we saw this with Tom Hanks advertising a dental uh, package he never knew about. We saw this recently with Taylor Swift having her face being used in a deep fake explicit imagery. So I say this all to say that no one is immune from becoming X-coded. So the X-coded is my term for anyone who's been harmed by AI systems. People like Portia Woodruff. She was arrested eight months pregnant for a carjacking. Now I don't know anyone carjacking at eight months pregnant. And more so than that, she reported having contractions when she was being held and had to be rushed to the emergency room when they finally let her out. So you put two lives in danger. What's even worse about this case is Portia was falsely arrested three years after Robert Williams was falsely arrested due to algorithms of discrimination by the same Detroit Police Department. In his case, he was arrested in front of his two young daughters, you see there with the hearts, and his wife uh, as well. And now you might think, okay, I might not get falsely arrested, this doesn't really apply to me. Anyone been on a plane lately? TSA, check out, all right. The, in 2018, the TSA said they have a plan to expand facial recognition to over 400 airports in the United States. They're currently piloting in 25 airports right now and growing. And so this is an area you'll see more of these types of AI-powered biometrics entering our lives. But you also have these systems in schools as well. Some hospitals are adopting them. And so since we got some issues, I decided to start the Algorithmic Justice League to really see how we can build towards a world with more equitable and accountable AI. And what got the Algorithmic Justice League started was, yes, that example of coding in a mask, being in white face to be detected, and also this research known as Gender Shades. So Gender Shades was my MIT thesis work, and I was inspired to explore it after I had that example with my face being misgendered. So I wanted to know, you know, how accurate are some of these companies when it comes to guessing the gender of various faces? Well, if you look at the overall accuracy, it might seem all right. Microsoft 94, you get an A. IBM 88, you get a B. Face plus plus, yeah. I'm a nice professor, 90%, you get an A. All right, but it starts to get a little bit more interesting once we start to uh, disaggregate by gender. So when we disaggregate by gender, you'll see that there's a gap where all of the systems work better on male-labeled faces than female-labeled faces. Similarly, if you disaggregate it by skin type, you'll see overall they all work better on lighter faces than darker faces. Then when we take it a step further to do an intersectional analysis, you'll see that there's variable performance. In some cases, the best case is on lighter males, 
In the case of Face++, their best case was on darker male faces. What was true and consistent across all of them was the worst performance was on darker females. And in this case, we see the gap between the best group and the worst group was around 34%. And these were for commercially sold products. So I shared the results with the companies and then I did a follow-up study because you'll notice we didn't include everybody. So in the follow-up study, we decided to include Amazon. And what surprised the research team the most was that Amazon's results were closer to where their competitors had been a year prior. This is like having the uh, test results already public and still not doing uh, so well. But I will say by 2020, all of the US-based companies that we audited actually took different types of steps to back away from providing facial recognition technologies to law enforcement. Woo, yes. So showing real world change is possible. So a lot of the work we do with the Algorithmic Justice League is about putting research into action, and that can look like uh, advocacy, whether it's advising uh, world leaders or people who are the top of uh, very influential uh, economies, hearings, and so forth. It can also look like art, like what we just saw with AI, Ain't I a Woman? We have ex exhibitions all around the world. If you'd like to bring some of that art into spaces you're a part of, let, we, let me know. I love to say, if you have a face, you have a place in the conversation about AI. And so the arts really takes us from performance metrics to performance art, so we get at the heart of what we're talking about. We also do a lot with media. Anyone seen the film Coded Bias? Yeah, yeah, check it out, Emmy-nominated Netflix. We're actually working on a new documentary, and we have the director and producer right here, so if you don't mind standing up, Javier Lavera and Ina. So we are looking for the stories of the X-coded, those who have been harmed, convicted, otherwise messed up by AI, and especially you. So please make sure to check them out, and if you have any partners you think could be helpful, let us know. So in addition to putting research into action, we also do different types of campaigns. As I mentioned earlier, TSA is planning to roll out facial recognition to make it the default way to travel. So we decided to ask people what their experiences have been. So with fly.ajl.org, we're hearing the majority of people don't even know you can opt out. Did you know it was voluntary? So even when a TSA officer tells you to step up, you actually have a right to refuse. And so we continue to push a Department of Homeland Security on this as well. And this is part of a larger effort around broader biometric rights, not just the right to refuse, but also the right to have your data deleted if it's already been collected. The right not to have non-consensual deep fakes uh, created of you uh, as well. Another area I think about quite a bit, particularly being an artist and being here with so many creatives, is what does creative rights and what should creative rights look like as we're advancing with generative AI systems. And so we've been thinking about these four Cs. So much of the best of what's made with AI is the best of us reflected and regurgitated, oftentimes taken without consent, taken without compensation, and taken without having any kind of real control. So what would it look like to create alternative AI pathway so that you can embrace these technologies, not worrying that it's based on stealing the hard fought talent and work of so many creatives in the world. So I will end on one more poem before we go into a discussion. So are you ready? One more poem. So as we're sitting here, there are many people who are dying, and some of those deaths are being enabled because of AI applied to warfare. And so as I've been watching alongside so many people here what's been going on, 
I was inspired to write a poem called Precisely Who Will Die. Precisely who will die. Some say AI is an existential risk. We see AI as an exterminating reality, accelerating annihilation, augmenting destruction. I heard of a new gospel, delivering death with the promise of precision, the code name for an old name, to target your enemy, the other, reduced to rubble. Face erased, name displaced, as the drones carry out in a formation that spells last shadow. AI wars first fought at the doors of our neighbors. Next, the bombs drop on your private chambers. Cease to believe fire on fire will deliver peace. Precisely who will die, zeroed out by ones and guns. And so to have this platform, the most important thing I can call for is an immediate ceasefire, of course, a ceasefire. Release of Palestinian and Israeli hostages. It's not anti-Semitic or Islamophobic to value human rights, life, and dignity. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> okay, purple. <laughs> Hi. Hey guys, I'm Mac. I'm a tech reporter at CNBC, and it is such a joy to join Dr. Joy on stage. Whoop, whoop. Um, you know, you just started and ended with poetry. You're the daughter of an artist and a scientist. It really seems to inform the work that you do today. But but tell me, how did that how did that uh, that formative experience kind of ripple into AJL? No, that's such a great question. So when I was growing up, I would go to my dad's lab, and he was always asking questions of cells, so I would get to feed cancer cells. My mom was asking questions of colors, so I'd go in the garage, and her paintings would be there. They were four feet. I was not yet four feet. I'm barely over four feet now, so at four, I was pretty tiny. Right? Wait, how, stand up. How tall are you? Let's see. Not four feet. Look, I got some boots, though, <laughs> okay, okay, so okay. the boots don't really work. <laughs> Anyhow, and so I thought it was all interesting, and I started asking questions about computers, because when I'd go to my dad's lab, there'd be computers all over the place. And he wanted to be an entrepreneur and learn how to code, so he would have coding books. And he just didn't have time. So I had a bunch of time, and I started learning uh, all, all kinds of things about a computer. So growing up, I didn't see those worlds as separate. They were literally companions. Mm. By the time I got to grad school, right, I, it seems like you can only choose one path or the other. And I fought so hard to be a woman in tech, right? To have my technical chops acknowledged. And so at first I thought if I brought in the art, if I brought in the poetry, people wouldn't take my research as seriously. And so it took me a long time to find the courage to, I've always been a poet, but to actually embrace that notion of being a poet of code. So that film you saw earlier at the beginning, AI Ain't I Woman, I wrote it after the Gender Shades research because you saw on the charts, right, that women of color always had the worst results. And I wanted to explore what that meant, not just with my research hat on, but with my human hat on as well. So, so many women I admired. You have Oprah Winfrey, right? You have also historic women, Ida B. Wells as well. And so that's how it happened, where I was shy to put a part of me that has always been there. And then when I had opportunities to actually share the poetry in some of the you know, most prestigious halls of power, I saw it was the storytelling that really brought people into the conversation about algorithmic justice. Now you mentioned uh, in your presentation just now your MIT thesis, mm -hmm. your doctoral thesis, Gender Shades. So much of the work that AJL is doing in the research domain is, is changing the behavior of big tech companies, which is really impressive. And in a sense, you're very much speaking truth to power. Uh, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM have all had to revise their corporate strategies, take commercial products that were being made available to police departments and to other enterprise clients. They've taken it off the market because of research that you've put out there. Can you tell us more about that kind of activist work that you're doing? Yes, for me, I always view it as good AI. So robust AI. So yes, you, you could position it as activist, and it's certainly advocacy. But for me, if you're creating tools that don't work on the global majority, 
have you really made a good tool in the first place? <laughs> right? So I think it's I think it can be interesting to see conversations where it's like, oh, AI ethics is over there and algorithms of discrimination. Are, no, for me, this is core and foundational. When you're learning about computer science, when you're learning about AI, you have to understand this is a part of building robust AI systems mm -hmm. and also be clear about both the limitations and the capabilities. We hear all the time about the potential capabilities. Limitations, no, not so much, right? And so really creating that culture where we are honest with ourselves. So for example, you might be well-intentioned and you wanna apply computer vision or AI to something like uh, detecting uh, heart disease or breast cancer. You wanna make sure that you're doing it in a robust way. Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to that example of you know some of these big tech companies that had to change their actions, take products off the market, that's, brave to, to, <laughs> to, to put this kind of research out there. I know that you faced blowback and you had some researchers and, and some academics come to uh, defend you when you were going through this. Others didn't because they were genuinely afraid of uh, professional repercussions. No, that's a good point. And I mean, I remember when I was going to do this work, um, some of the older graduate students around me advised me not to do it. They said, you know, you could get pigeonholed you know you could be attacked, you know you might be discredited. And the first study that came out was largely broadly embraced, and so I was like, whew, dodged a bullet. Made it. <laughs> Made it, we out here. Then we went up against Amazon, uh-oh. Now you have a corporate <laughs> vice president, you know, saying that your research is misleading, mm -hmm. right? On national news, you know, my mom using Amazon, she's like, are you sure your numbers are right? I'm like, how are you going to turn my own mom against me? Mom, I'm right. Right. My dad loves to always say that he believed in the numbers from the beginning as a scientist. So anyway, so I'll leave the family stuff out of this. Anyway, in this... <laughs> And this is, okay, this is the Amazon product that they started pushing in 2017 to police departments, Recognition. right? Recognition. Recognition, okay. Yes, and so this part was really interesting to me because even though publicly Amazon was attempting to discredit the research, behind the scenes there were people on the inside letting us know the problems were even worse. So whistleblowers were coming to you directly. All kinds of folks go to the Algorithmic Justice League. So if you got a story, report.ajl.org. How, how do people reach you? you report.ajl.org. Okay. And you can share whatever else is happening. And so this was really helpful for me to see because no company is made of one person. There are individuals within companies oftentimes who are seeing things that aren't going well and want to speak up. And so part of what I was hoping is to see me as a grad student at the time, probably not on the top of the food chain, <laughs> right? To go up against these companies to encourage others. But there are also real risks. So the uh, master's thesis work that I did the paper that was published, Gender Shades, I co-authored it with somebody named Dr. Timnit Gebru. Yeah, some of you might have heard of her. And so she is now the founder of the Distributed AI Research Network. She started that after she was kicked out of Google for doing her job. She was the co-lead of the Google AI ethics team. And long before some of the issues we see with large language models, the type of AI systems that power chatbots, uh, she and her co-authors warned about the toxic outputs and so forth. This widely known paper called Stochastic Parrots. We just like to have fun with these academic titles. Anyhow, <laughs> Stochastic Parrots. So th the higher ups at Google were not happy. Why? Because when we did facial recognition, that was not their cash area, you know? But once you start getting into text and search and language, now you're at the juggler. Yeah. And so unfortunately that did not work out, but maybe fortunately for the rest of the world, right? She now has uh, her organization uh, that she leads. But that is to say there are real risk to speaking up. Some of what I hope our work with the Algorithmic Justice League does and also sibling organizations is it makes it normal. So now this isn't that you have to be on some kind of crusade to, you know, it's like, oh no, this is just how we talk about developing products that actually work well 
for the rest of humanity. Mm -hmm. And you know, you launched AJL in 2016, so <laughs> I, mean, I can't even imagine how much your mission statement has evolved in the last eight mm -hmm. years, and especially since so many of these you know, LLM-based products launched in the last uh, year, I feel everyone has become an AI expert of sorts, or any, any sort of journalist that was even remotely covering tech became an AI, or tried to become an AI expert overnight. And my question to you is, is one, how has the work that you have done changed in the last year in a post-chat GBT world? Mm -hmm. and, and, and have your uh, key objectives had to change because of that tech that's been put into the hands of the masses? It's interesting because when I defended uh, my dissertation to, I always called getting my PhD mission Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Justice. So when I finished mission Dr. Justice, the last slide on the defense was GPT-2. So I was showing that the examples I had with the computer vision systems weren't just about computer vision. And so even with GPT-2, we'd already seen it auto-completing. So you would say, two Muslims go into a bar and then the way it would auto-complete it would be Islamophobic, right? Or you would see all of these sorts of issues. So people who've been studying AI systems who didn't become AI experts last week, right, that we saw this coming, right? And I do think the work of the Algorithmic Justice League continues to be ever-present, especially now with this adoption, widespread adoption of biometric technologies entering into many spaces. And we've been doing research for years. We've been collecting people's stories and seeing the ways in which these uh, technologies can be harmful. And we also have research back recommendations, right, that we've uh, written for uh, governments around the world. And so I think, if anything, we were prepared for such a time as this. So one note, I, in front of me, have questions that the audience is, is feeding in. Please feel free to do so, because I'm going to take them throughout this discussion. Peter Y just uh, put one in that I think is relevant to that conversation we were just having. Can you talk about the prompt transformation controversy at the heart of Gemini's image generation that's, that's kind of been in the news lately? Oh, yeah. So f do you want to give some context to the no, audience? No, you, you go for it. Yeah. OK, so Google released Gemini. Gemini was based on BARD. And this is Google's way of saying, we too have generative AI. We've got ChatGPT too. <laughs> right? You know, and we're going to do it better. <laughs> So they released a model called uh, Gemini. I think this one was 1.5, correct me if I'm wrong. And what people saw is for the text to image feature, when they would put in a prompt like, show me a pope, they would get an image of a dark-skinned person as a pope or a woman as a pope. But if you know anything about the papacy, that just isn't going to happen, right? <laughs> you would also have a prompt for something like the founding fathers of the United States. It was looking like the Hamilton cast, you know, reimagine <laughs> some melanin in there, you know? I was like, OK, right? And then uh, people started getting upset. They're like, where's the history? I'm being left out. Some people positioned it as Google now has woke um, AI. Others positioned it, <laughs> that's how some people positioned it. Others said that they had over uh, corrected in their attempt to have the results reflect what they would say our global user base, right? They had gone too far. What I found interesting was how quickly they put down that model when people said those who were used to being centered were now erased because there's so many others who have oftentimes been marginalized and erased, and when those concerns were put out, we did not see the expeditious, exactly, to actually address what was going on. And so what I take away from this is the importance of a cultural audit, right? Because you have to know the intent of somebody. Maybe you are trying to do a something like Hamilton and make a commentary, or maybe you're looking for something that's factual you need to know intent. And all of this is to say that addressing issues of algorithmic bias and algorithmic discrimination is not that easy. You have to approach it with nuance. So I like to think of addressing issues of algorithmic bias more like treating a chronic disease and managing a chronic disease than trying to target out an infection. 
And so here you think about a continuous process. So what does algorithmic hygiene look like? I wouldn't shower once in 2016 and think I'm good. You know, <laughs> it just wouldn't make sense. So similarly for the way these products are rolled out, it needs to be iterative and it needs to have the perspectives, the historical perspectives, the cultural perspectives as well. Oftentimes the very people who aren't in the rooms when well, they're being ex developed. Yeah, exactly that. Because there's, there's this argument that, you know, technology is neutral and you've got algorithms uh, that are just essentially math and math is neutral. So the tech is fine. Um, I mean, that's problematic because of what you're just saying. The people who are in the room when you're developing the tech in the first place, there can be implicit bias there. There are a lot of conversations about like data as an input, what these models are being trained on. Yeah. So let's talk more about what's happening like under the hood, so to speak, in, in terms of like, you know, promulgating uh, the problem. Yes. So in the book, I talk about this notion of power shadows because I came to MIT. I'm supposed to be in this epicenter of innovation, but I'm calling in a white mask. So I have some questions. Right, they're fairly smart people working on these projects. And I also had to remind myself, I was the software developer that made the Aspire mirror that didn't detect my face. So it's not just about the people you put in the room, you also have a legacy of processes. Mm -hmm. You have a legacy of databases. You have a legacy of established AI models as well. And so when we're thinking about AI in particular, we're not saying math isn't neutral in the sense of one plus one equals two. We're saying when we're looking at pattern recognition systems, which is generally how AI is developed right now, the way you recognize patterns is based on a training data set. And when machines are learning from us, they get the good, bad, and fugly, you know? Like, and that's what we're seeing in the outputs of these systems. And then where does AJL like, come in at this point? We talked about some of the research that you did before, uh, like targeted at big tech and, and some of the problematic practices there and, and how you help those companies course correct. What are you at the cutting edge uh, of right now? Like, what, what, what research are you doing to try to stop this problem? Well, this part that I see now, we've opened up this whole area of AI audits, I'll see a new company doing AI audits and that kind of thing. So we're always trying to say, okay, what is missing? And oftentimes what's missing is redress. If you've been harmed by an AI system, where do you go? Like, who do you go to for help? We're saying the Algorithmic Justice League, so that's why we've actually started building this AI harms reporting platform. But that's also powered by people like AI harms analysts, mm -hmm. right? It's a whole ecosystem of what it looks like to start addressing some of the people who've been harmed by AI systems. Because yes, we want to do our best to create more robust AI systems so we're minimizing the harms, but we don't want to forget about the people who've already been harmed or sadly will be harmed by these systems and making sure that there are pathways for redress. And th this is where we go back to the, the two terms that you introduced in your book, the coded gaze and the X-coded. Right. Um, and how are you working with the, and, and let, let's refresh the audience what the definition of both of those terms is, and then how are you helping the X-coded? Sure, so the coded gaze is like male gaze, white gaze, building on this notion that who has the power to shape technology leaves their fingerprints. And so the preferences, the priorities, right? Who's saying it's going to be a chatbot interface, right? Somebody gets to uh, decide that. And so that's this notion of the coded gaze. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the X coded, no one is immune from AI harm. So that example where I was showing, there's Taylor Swift, right? You have uh, Tom Hanks, you have Portia Woodruff, you have yourselves, you know? Anyone can be X-coded, and that was a message I really wanted to drive in to the book. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got an audience question here that I want to work in from Faya. She said, is an equal AI possible? How can we break the system when it's been based on information that's biased, already biased information? Oh, that's such a great question because I hear all the time people are like, let's eradicate bias, let's get rid of the bias, which is all fine and well, but I'm like, did you get rid of the humans? <laughs> because unless if you get rid of humans, you always have to go back to values and somebody's values will be embedded. The question is, do you have an equitable way of thinking through those values? So I don't think the goal is to make AI uh, equal. I'm not even sure what that would mean. And in international conversations I've been in or various sorts of uh, governing bodies, what quickly comes up is regional differences, right? So what might seem fair from a Western 
uh, context might not seem as fair from an Eastern context, from a Global South context uh, as well. So I do think we have to be more specific about how do we reduce harm? That's, what I, that's the question I'm asking, or the other questions like who benefits from the system and who has to shoulder the burdens? And how can we reduce those kinds of gaps? And, you know, I have a, a question out of that, but just a side one here, and it's from an anonymous um, uh, uh, Anonymous question. Yeah, but it's not, I mean. Put it's, your name on <laughs> It's okay. Stay anonymous. Stay anonymous. <laughs> but it kind of goes, because you're just getting to the point of, like, uh, you know, what's okay in one culture might not be okay in another. And this question kind of gets at this idea of what are the challenges that you see uh, in terms of, you know, languages that aren't English and, 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 and like, the, the language differential there. Oh, massive. Yeah. Absolutely massive. You've already had instances where people wanted to adapt uh, chat GPT to a different context and a different language, and it just didn't make sense at all. And so you will continue to see this dominance of English, right, within these systems if we only look at one company or one major type of uh, AI product as the end-all, be-all. And so oftentimes companies, which makes sense, they will try to be the one, the system. Instead, you want a healthy ecosystem, right, where you can have specific language models for particular regions. And I think sometimes in this quest to be bigger, 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 there are a lot of men in the AI industry, <laughs> right, that you forget, you know, that you can actually be more bespoke and uh, specific. So I think there's an advantage for those who have that data that's for specific context that actually wouldn't be touched by more general purpose systems. So on that point, uh, you know, given the impacts of algorithmic, algorithmic bias and being a part of this, you know, so-called X-coded group, how do you envision the role of women? We were just talking about how men kind of <laughs> approach things, the bigger, 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 but like, how, how do you as a woman and a woman of color think about shaping the future of AI? What, you know, contributions do you think are essential for creating a more equitable technological landscape? One is knowing that you're worthy and that your perspectives and your ideas matter. I think that is core. And that can be if you're a woman of color, it can be a person of color, it could be someone I see white, right? That your perspective matters. And I say this because when I started, I didn't know how far sharing my story as a student of coding in a white mask would go. I didn't even know what the research would reveal. And for the record, like it, her, so her academic research was in the New York Times multiple times. <laughs> Ended up like, I mean, I, 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 like I said, it was a complete call to action for a lot of these tech companies yes. to have to revise their policies. Absolutely, one of the most uh, highly cited papers in the, uh, you know, my field and all of that good jazz. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal. Right, but going, but Sorry, going, going back to your yeah, point. But, but going back to the point of why women's perspectives matter, why marginalized perspectives matter, oftentimes when you're not in the mainstream, you can see what others don't, and there's the motivation to prioritize it. So when I look at the research I did as a graduate student, I collected a database of 1,270 images. I collected it in a very specific way and tested three companies to start with, right? That is arguably a kind of test anyone could have done, certainly any large company with billions of dollars of resources, more than I had as a graduate <laughs> student. So this question of why it didn't happen goes back to priority and perspective. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's so important that we understand what we're losing when we have really homogenous fields. And so again, if you're marginalized for whatever reason, it could also be because of disability, right? All of these isms and the ways they intersect, there's so much ageism in tech as well, and these are all important perspectives that we're losing. So something that's really keeping me up at night right now, this is a banner election year. You've got two billion voters headed to the polls in 50 countries. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and I just feel like, I feel like we're not ready for it. I feel like, you know, we're already 
in the past, election interference has been a thing. Mm -hmm. And now we have tools that are just like making it uh, so easy to like create deep fakes. And already, like at least here in the US, uh, the tip of the iceberg is, you know, Joe Biden's voice being used for robo calls in New Hampshire to tell his base not to vote. And I, I just, I like, I, I mean, you've been in the room with uh, President Biden, you were advising him on AI policy. But I guess to, to start, my question is, is any, <laughs> One, is anyone doing anything? Are, like, are you talking to political campaigns? Is anyone seeking out advice to try to get ahead of this? Uh, two, how worried are you about like an election cycle as big as this with the kind of tools that we have today that we didn't, let's say, four years ago during the last presidential cycle? Extremely worried to answer your question. And when I was on the fall tour for Unmasking AI, I was in conversation with Sam Altman about the future of AI. And this was one area we found agreement on. <laughs> Right, you know, when it came to um, deep fakes, misinformation, disinformation, and that piece. Yes, you do have a consortia of different sorts of companies trying to come up with things like content credentialing. So saying we might not be able to test every image mm -hmm. to see, you know, the provenance, but we can at least put some sort of blue badge or something else you can trust, right, to say this came from a credible source. So you do have people putting in uh, efforts, even in that roundtable with President Biden that happened uh, last June, there were concerns, right, about biometrics. Yeah. And then it's the biometric of the voice that's being used in these robocalls. We've seen the FCC now make it illegal to do those kind of uh, non-consensual robocalls over time. So we are seeing agencies start to step up as well. I think it's really important that the companies that are highly influential, like OpenAI, not release certain tools ahead of an election year, particularly without <laughs> guidelines, right? So it's like, okay, the demo might have been nice. Let's expand it out. So I talk about in the book, for example, the prompt of a uh, pope in a puffer jacket. That's not too far off from uh, doing a prompt that could uh, incite religious violence, mm -hmm. you know? And so thinking through not just what could be fun, but what can go wrong. So let's, I wanna go back to that conversation that you had with President Biden. It was a, you know, like I said, behind closed doors, it was a round table. What, what, I mean, I don't know how much like you're allowed to say, but what was said in the room? What did, what did you say? What did he say? And has anything come of it in the last nine months? <laughs> Are you under NDA, like an NDA? <laughs> I can't speak to everything that was said in the room. What I can speak about is what I brought up with the Algorithmic Justice League, but all the juiciest details are in the epilogue of the book. It's called <laughs> oh, Seat at the Table. There, and I want to repeat this. I know the MC said at the beginning, but there is a book signing right yes. after this? Yes, at the bookstore. But that last chapter goes into the nitty gritty of the secret service and everything else. And then sitting next to Governor Newsom, who's so tall with his perfect hair that I kept having to do this. <laughs> to try to see, you know, <laughs> President Biden, that whole thing. So you get all the uh, details. And then I was also reflecting, you know, being 30-ish at the time and him being 80-ish <laughs> at the time, that 50-year age gap and how, you know, decades, centuries ago, that round table wouldn't have even uh, been a thing as well. Yeah. But two, so. <laughs> out here making history. But to your question, uh, a major part I brought up was the need for biometric rights. Okay. And that was before he even had the robocall uh, situation. But understanding that if we don't protect our biometric rights, the ways in which these deep fakes uh, can proliferate will really compromise our understanding of what's true or who we can believe uh, at all. And I was saying in that particular moment that there was a lot we could learn from the EU with the AI, EU AI Act, which was putting specific restrictions on uh, the use of facial recognition in public spaces. So that, that is what I brought to the conversation. That's what I can speak on and everything <laughs> else that's uh, in the epilogue. Other things, it was a closed door, yeah. I do feel, so there have been some competing bill, well, multiple competing bills on the AI front and sometimes too many bills is as good as having none. Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> you know, I, I think, and you mentioned the EU being more, uh, you know, uh, 
forward thinking in their policy, or at least having a policy that they're pushing well, for. That part. Um, and I think that that's, we, we saw that same dynamic happen with respect to crypto policy, something called Mika in the EU. In the US, we still lack any sort of hard and fast rules. We're seeing that entire dynamic repeat itself in the context of AI. And uh, you have spoken positively about some of the you know, potential legislation out there to kind of create a framework around AI in the US. What, what, what do you think would work for us? I think we really can learn from some of the work that has already gone on. And so the White House actually released something called an AI Bill of Rights. This is and October? -ish, of the fall? Other years, yeah. Okay. But the AI Bill of Rights, it came from the Biden administration, and it was saying if AI systems are to be released, right, we have a right to be protected from AI discrimination. It also said we have a right to Data privacy, oh my goodness, what? that part is huge. <laughs> Another thing that I think was so important and is oftentimes missed is to have the right to have meaningful alternatives. I'll give you one example. You had uh, the IRS. Anybody familiar with the IRS? Okay. <laughs> so they decided um, for people to access their tax information online to make it more secure and to reduce fraud, they would adopt biometric technology, facial recognition. So they hired a third party vendor. And this third party vendor, the way it worked is if you already had an account, you didn't need to use it, but any new user would have to submit their face. So in some ways they'll claim it was voluntary, but if you didn't do it, then you couldn't create your account. And you also had other agencies, like people doing veterans benefits and so forth, adopting it. So you had veterans who weren't a, like, you know, 70 year old man in Colorado, right? Can't access his benefits because his camera technology isn't quite up to snuff. But I bring all of these examples up to say sometimes there's this push to upgrade the government with the latest technical gadgetry and you leave so many people behind. And so another part, if we're thinking about what comprehensive AI legislation should look like, are these meaningful alternatives? So it's not the only way. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that I think um, has <laughs> been wild has been this news cycle around the Kate Middleton photo. And it's, <laughs> so for, for, first off, and we were talking about this before this conversation got started, and you're like, that's a cheap fake, not a deep fake. So let's, 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 let's explain that. And then I want to talk about some of the tools that are, are being built right now to combat the real thing, the deep fakes. All right, class in session. Yes, <laughs> the difference between cheap fake and deep fake. So deep fakes generally are a bit more sophisticated where there's some kind of AI system involved to take your biometrics and put it on something else, right? Cheap fake can be Photoshop, right? You don't have to be all that fancy, you know, just try to blur out, add a little filter. So you have deep fakes and cheap fakes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I was talking to this one, uh, this one founder of a new app, and it's basically the, uh, this cool intersection of Web3 tech and AI, and so essentially what it's doing is looking to prove the provenance of photos, videos, and actually documents. So, uh, you know, imprinting it onto the blockchain as a way to say, hey, this definitely wasn't, you know, we can verify the, the location and the time that it was taken. And the reason that they're doing that is that they say that the two systems out there for kind of like spotting deep fakes just aren't working. So you can watermark it, mm -hmm. uh, but that can be removed. Sure. Uh, and then there are technologies out there that are meant to detect deep fakes, but they, it's like, a, you know, it's a failing battle. Even like the, the, you know, things that the military are using can't keep pace with how fast this tech is evolving. So it seems like this point of origin, like fixing the yeah. problem, having specific apps to like imprint it on the blockchain might be one solution, but what, what, what do you think? What's our best defense? I, I think that approach, right, is in this larger area of content credentialing, mm, right, to yeah. show a provenance or to show a trusted uh, source. I actually think of this other huge issue that looms with AI, which is its environmental footprint and impact. I've been talking about nuclear power this week because it seems like that's the only way, like Sam Altman has been talking, I mean, he backs two nuclear power companies because it seems like that's the only way you can generate enough power to scale AI. It's fine because I was in conversation with, we were going back and forth, so I was like, you actually don't need fusion, okay. right, <laughs> to, to solve the uh, energy piece. But that, that is an aside. What was your question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just like, I don't know how you fight deep fakes. I, I like, yeah. I, so yeah, at the point of 
origin, you can take oh, a, yeah. Okay, go. this is the point I wanted to get to. If you're doing the point of origin being blockchain, depending on the way you set it up, right, there's also this huge environmental uh, footprint yes. okay. that's happening. And so we see this with the way many large language models were developed, and it's not just you think about the entire AI life cycle. So what it took to develop it, how much compute, that environmental impact. But then you also have the water footprint as well. And so each time that you are putting in a prompt, and depending on the time of day, there's an environmental impact to that as well. So I would say in this quest of trying to safeguard the truth in some manner, not forgetting the uh, externality of environmental impact as well with the various approaches. So I'm not saying I have answers. I'm here to look at the problem alongside <laughs> you. No. no, I mean, it is it is pretty wild when you think about it. I, I'm not going to take you through a, a listicle of all the numbers in terms of like just how much energy is needed to scale AI, but this is in a world before LLMs or integrated into just search engines. Uh, I can't even imagine like the, you know, the many multiples of energy that it can be required once that happens. One quick side note, just you know, to wrap up this fine point on around yeah. politics, the White House a month ago said that they were looking to cryptographically sign documents because we've also seen this dynamic of like you know, press releases being deep faked and then having stock prices move on that. Yeah. Uh, video of the Pentagon on fire like was moving markets. Like this is this is scary, and it's having a big impact on companies. On it's rippling into people's wallets, the shareholders. Uh, is that this? I mean, I, I guess the last thing I'll just ask about this is: is blockchain the solution to that? Is this like cryptographic uh, stamp of approval going to help us counter those kinds of deep fakes, at least in the document space? Again, I, I, I view that all under this content credentialing, and I do think it's important that you have provenance, mm -hmm. right? And I think it's all, also important that you don't just have provenance of the outputs that are going out. So it could be the press release, it could be the I think the Pentagon might have also been a cheap fake, but anyhow, which, whichever, whichever way that um, you're doing it. But it's important to have the data provenance of the sources that went into the creation of the model. So when we look at so many large language uh, models, sometimes that data is stolen work. Yeah, from artists, uh, we see so I mean, many class. <laughs> class say all those lawsuits. That, no, uh, class AI actions, stuff. but not just open AI, right? You yeah. look at uh, stability AI as well. We have given many companies uh, almost this free pass, mm -hmm. right? But I don't think that free pass is going to last forever. You know, I got the New York Times coming knocking and yeah. others who are understanding the value of this data. So I think that uh, provenance needs to also apply to the data. And for me, when you read, you know, Kenyan workers being paid less than $2 an hour and now having, uh, you know, PS, all, all of the post-traumatic distress from looking at some of the worst imagery online, honestly, in order to do content moderation or detoxify these systems that are then used elsewhere to increase profits of others. I want that ethical AI pipeline or that fair trade data or, or something that's giving me a sense of how this was made and was it made in a humane manner. So I feel like everyone and everyone is trying to find a way to integrate AI into their business models. You know, like in Davos, yeah. the promenade was like every every single storefront had an AI theme. Here at South by Southwest, the AI programming track is just dominating the tech conversation. And my question is to you is like, you know, earlier on we were talking about how you were maybe at odds with big tech companies and having to like fight back, but are they coming to you now? Like maybe not even big tech, but like a Palantir, like, you know, as they look to integrate AI into their business model, are you working with companies or are, if it's not you in particular, are you seeing that there's a, a greater level of awareness of, oh, we need to integrate this into what we're doing. We want to do it in a responsible and right way. What's the framework to do that? So a few things, right? So in the book, I talk about walking into Davos. You have prime ministers, you have presidents, and you have one poet of code. I'm in my red jacket, and there's a sniper, you know, on the rooftop. And I'm, and I'm on this panel, right? It's like a, it's a mantle, except for me, <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
And this was in 2019, and I was talking about my research, and it was right before the study about Amazon came out. So I actually got on a, I got on a flight from Zurich to Honolulu, and by the time I landed, the paper had come out. So all these reporters were reaching out. Yeah. So when I was doing that initial work, I never really positioned myself in an adversarial way with companies. At least I didn't think so. You might think AI ain't I woman is another thing, but I call that an invitation to conversation. <laughs> and part of it is thinking about naming and changing versus naming and shaming. So by pointing it out, we're actually better positioned to address it in some kind of way. And so that's part of what, what I was doing when I was in Davos that first uh, time around. Now this fear of missing out AI everywhere integrated, it's not even AI, it's regression, or maybe it's a cheap fake, you call it a deep fake, and now I claim there is an AI in it somehow. I think you really have to ask yourself, what is the value I'm anticipating by adopting whatever AI integration it is? And do I have any kind of evidence that value will come through? And maybe you do a smaller pilot. One example I like to give is the National uh, Institute uh, uh, for Eating Disorders. They were all excited about uh, AI and chatbots. Chatbots will replace humanity. So what they decided to do was to actually fire uh, their uh, call center people. The call center people had unionized. They don't want to deal with it. They fired the call center people. OK. So that's one headline. I think it's May 22nd or something like that. National Eating Disorder Association fires call center workers and replaces with chatbot. It wasn't even two weeks later when they had to shut the chatbot down. Hmm. Next headline, chatbot no longer online. Why? Because the chatbot was actually giving advice that's known to make eating disorders worse. And sometimes it's so easy to assume the work you don't know about or you don't do is easily automatable, mm -hmm. right? And so I would caution, I'm not saying you can't explore or pilot, but that wholesale adoption is based on not how powerful AI is, but the stories we tell ourselves about the power of AI. And so that's why I think it always comes back to the storytelling. So I want to think, what are the stories we want to tell our children, our grandchildren, the next generation about what we did for the cause for algorithmic justice while we were here. So we have about a minute left, and my last question to you is twofold. One, what keeps you up at night when you think about mm -hmm. uh, where everything in the AI sector is going? Uh, yeah. You're always ahead of the curve, so very keen to hear what you're worried about, but also what most excites you? Like, what, what is at the cutting edge right now that nobody is talking about that will hit the mainstream in six months? What worries me, and I think it is already hitting, but will hit even more, are lethal autonomous weapons. So think drones, guns, facial recognition. Suddenly accuracy isn't the only question, right? Should we have these sorts of systems? And in the poem when I talked about this uh, notion of a new gospel, that's talking about an AI system that is being used to target individuals, right, in Gaza right now. And so for me, when you're automating uh, warfare and you're taking out that human cost, digital dehumanization doesn't end in one location of the world. The tools of war oftentimes become the tools of police. The surveillance technologies that you think are being used over there for whoever you're saying is bad now can very easily be turned on you. And so lethal autonomous weapons keep me up at night. That's why you know, in the book I talk about the campaign to stop killer robots because these tools and capabilities are being developed right now. And just like we had the convention on conventional weapons to say certain weaponry shouldn't exist, we can push back. But oftentimes we're told it's too late or we're powerless. And my work and the work of the algorithmic Justice League shows time and time again that we have a voice and we have a choice, and we don't have to accept digital dehumanization. What are you excited about? Real quick. <laughs> and yes. Well, very, very quick. <laughs> I'm excited also about the creative potential yeah. of AI. I remember uh, going to MoMA and seeing one of the uh, uh, beautiful uh, kind of data artworks. And as I was seeing the artworks, being a poet, I was like, oh, that looks like cosmic hay or whatever else <laughs> it was, right? And so I was thinking about this kind of 
interesting human AI collaboration that still very much centers our humanity. Uh, thank you so much for the conversation as the audience for joining us. Yes. <laughs> Not this purple. <laughs>